Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12. We're taking a look at one piece of scripture out of all of this that Jesus was speaking. And it's an interesting look, not into our home life, but into our heart life. We ask the question, are you strong enough? You see, for, for men, and here on Father's Day as we think about men, strength is important. As I am getting a little older now, not much, a little older, The abilities that I used to possess when I was in my 20s, I don't really have as I used to. I can't climb mountains the way I did. I certainly don't want to try and play football. I don't have the strength that I used to. Now I could probably work out a little bit, lose a little weight, do some things to strengthen myself. But strength is important. In fact, Paul tells Timothy, for physical training is of some value. But godliness has value for all things. Are you strong enough to bear up the life of Christ in a world that despises him? Are you strong enough to take and lead your home to follow Jesus when all the world tells you not to? Are you strong enough when the enemy comes to invade your space? Are you strong enough to withstand him and the onslaught that will arrive? Is your life under siege? Or do you even know? You see, there is a real assault that is happening in the heart and homes of God's people today. An invasion of sorts that has breached the outer defenses and is attempting to steal all that we hold precious. Are you strong enough to stand against it? Jesus said this, and this is our text today. Matthew 12, 29, or again, How can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. Let's pray. Father, as we take a look at this text today and we ask the question, are we strong enough? My heart's answer right now, Father, before you is no. I'm not. I have the strength to withstand the onslaught of the world or the enemy. But I know that there's strength to be found. And here in this moment, Father, when we have to stand before you and your word, I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen the heart of every man here to become a man of God, to become a man after God's own heart, to seek the Lord while he may be found, to call upon him while he is near, to, to, to forsake our ways of this world and embrace the way of Christ. I ask you, Lord Jesus, bless us, not with the physical strength of the world, but with the spiritual strength of the Spirit. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. We have three questions that we're going to ask in this, and we're going to use this as a template to take a look at the spiritual life that we possess. And the first question we're going to ask is, has the thief entered your house? You see, Jesus said, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Well, the reality is that means somebody has had to enter first. Somebody's actually had to come in. Now, you say, well, preacher, but what do you mean by entering into my house? Have you allowed the enemy to take a foothold into your life so that he has access to you to tie you up? Do you allow pride 
or give room for jealousy or lust or unforgiveness or indifference or selfishness or greed or any other qualities that are set against Christ? Do you allow room for these things in your heart, in your life, and in your home? You see, I think we have invited the enemy in more than we realize, more than we even possibly know, that we have, we have allowed him access. And the next stage in the process, then, is that he ties us up. We'll see that in a moment. But we begin by asking the question, has the thief entered your house? Why do we lock our doors? Really, why, why, why don't you just leave the keys in your car when you park it? Because eventually you're not going to have a car waiting for you in the driveway. Why do we lock our homes? Why, every night, it's a habit of mine, it's a, I'm a little pernicious about it, um, Patty will attest to that. She could lock up the entire house, and it's my habit to go through and make sure it's all locked up anyway. She could tell me, well, Michael, I've already locked the house up. Well, that's nice. Thank you, dear. doesn't stop me from checking. I go from door to door, window to window, every night to make sure the house is secure. Why? I have precious treasure in my home, and it's not the television. It's my wife and three kids. While I am unconscious at sleep, these precious things to me have got to be guarded to my best ability. Now, I could try and stay up all night, but I will go through and lock the doors and the windows and make sure that that which I treasure is guarded. Why do we lock our homes? Why do we put alarms on our buildings and cameras on every corner? We are concerned with the safety of our material possessions, and yet how much do we care about the security of our souls? What do you put on your heart to protect it from the enemy? The Bible says over all these virtues, the virtues of Christ, put on love. The Bible tells us to put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand in the day of evil. What do we do to protect ourselves from the entrance of the enemy who has come to bind us up? We saw in the very first slide the scripture passage out of Proverbs that says, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Literally it means to set a watchman before your heart. Set a watchman before your heart because out of it flows the issues of life. Job said this, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Think about that. I've made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look upon a woman with lust. He's made a promise to his own eyes. He said, eyes, I promise you, I will not look upon other women. I've got a wife, that's all I need. I think we allow the enemy access into our lives far more than we realize. And God gives us this warning out of the book of Genesis when he's speaking to this fellow named Cain. If you do what is right, he says, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Literally, it desires to control you, to master you, but you must master it. Think about that image for just a moment. Sin is crouching at your door. What would you do if you opened your door and you saw a cougar crouching at your door? Where's the gun? Give me something to prevent this animal from entrance into my home. You open the door and there is a bear crouching at your door. You do everything you can to protect yourself, your loved ones, your property, your possessions. What if you open the door and there was a murderer crouching at your door? What would you do? And why, when sin is crouching at our door, do we invite it in? 
We're all that way. Every one of us. We have allowed the sins of this world to invade our homes, our lives, our hearts, our families, our entertainment. Our, our, it, it manipulates us in every possible way to try and gain entrance into our lives. Have you allowed the thief to come in? You need to examine what you have. I had a friend. Music is important to me. If you haven't noticed, I love music. And I had a friend in the military. His name was Dan. And, and he was my roommate. He was a Christian. And he listened to this god-awful music. It was, it was, I don't know, some heavy metal, nightmarish stuff that if you listen to it, you sound like two cars are crashing. I don't know what it sounded like to me. And it was just awful. And, and I was praying for him because he was my roommate and he would listen to this. I mean, guess who else had to listen to it? I had to listen to it. And I'm begging him, please, can you? And there, there is good hard rock Christian groups too, I said. Yeah, but I like this kind of music. All right, I understand. It was speaking, of course, against the Lord, against the church, and against virtue and, and righteousness. And it was speaking about sex, drugs, and rock and roll as it would go. And one day, I'm walking back home to my barracks, and I lived on the third floor, and I hear my name being shouted across the complex. I'm in the parking lot, probably a hundred yards away, and I look up, and I see this black figure in my window, and I hear my name being shouted across, and I'm like, oh my God, that's my roommate, and he's going to jump. And I'm shouting back, Dan, Dan, wait, Dan, don't, wait. And all of a sudden, I see this thing come out of the window. And I hear it crash upon the pavement. And I thought my friend was dead. And I go running to him. And I get there, and it's a black 50-gallon garbage bag. And in it were these broken tapes and CDs that he, he, he crushed with his hands and he hit with hammers and he did everything he could to break these things apart and put them in there. And he comes running down the stairs and I, I'm, I'm still in that panic mode. I'm like, Dan, what are you doing? He said, Michael, I got to listening to my music and all of a sudden he says, I finally heard the lyrics. He said, how could I have ever allowed this into my mind? He said, I want you to know that all of my music, now this guy had probably several hundred tapes and CDs, thousands of dollars worth that he broke apart and threw away. And he asked me, he said, will you take this to the dumpster and throw it away for me? I said, no, but I'll go with you to do it. And together we walked, we both grabbed one side of the bag and away we went and threw it in the dumpster and he never listened to it again because he didn't want that invading his life anymore. See, we allow this to come in, and we've allowed the thief to enter our house. Has the thief entered your house? The next question then, of course, is have you been tied up? Have you been tied up? How can he enter, how can he steal, unless he first ties up the strong man? See, once you allow him in, he's got only one purpose, the enemy does. That's to bind you down, to tie you up, to take everything in your life that's precious and valuable. Has he tied you up? I'm going to tell you what it looks like to be bound. That you've allowed a particular sin in your life. Whatever that sin might be. It might be lust, might be greed, might be, I don't know, gossip for all I know. We'll use gossip as the illustration. You've allowed gossip into your life. Instead of when people wanting to come and gossip with you, you say, whoa, 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 no gossip here. This is the gossip-free zone. You know, well, tell me what you got on your mind. And so you invite it in. And now you're like, oh, my goodness gracious, listen to that. That might, That's salacious. That's great. That's good news. I, I can go tell everybody now. And you start spreading the word about the things that you heard. And one quart at a time, you're tying yourself up. The enemy's just got you now. 
Maybe anger. You've allowed anger into your life. And now the devil's going to bind you up in violence. Maybe unforgiveness is where you've allowed, and you've been hurt, you've been sinned against, and you have the right to feel the way you feel. I have the right to be hurt. I have the right to hold them accountable. I have the right to have justice and judgment fall upon them. Yeah, maybe you have the right. But now you're also bound up with unforgiveness. Maybe it's lust. Well, you know, it's, it's not pornography. It's only Victoria's secret. Well, Victoria needs to keep her secrets. So you invite it in. And you say, well, it's just, it's just a little internet surfing. It's not really bad. And you're tying yourself up. You say, well, it's just one drink, Pastor. Well, one drink isn't going to hurt anything, is it? I don't know. Dr. Pepper doesn't hurt. Um, root beer doesn't hurt. Beer without the root, that may start hurting a little bit. But it's just one drink. Well, if you're an alcoholic, one drink can destroy your life and bind you up. You see, we allow the enemy to tie us up and bind us up so that he can steal what is precious to us. It is a terrifying thing to feel powerless, to be bound and unable to defend yourself or those you love. And those who have allowed the enemy into their homes and their hearts will ultimately find themselves bound up and helpless. It is terrifying when you think you are powerless to control it. When you think you are powerless to defend yourself. I can't fight it anymore. I, I can't tell you how many people in this town that I've talked to that have got drug addicted problems. That are telling me that very thing. Well you don't understand. I can't fight it anymore. It's overpowering. I, I, I'm tied to it. It is who I am now. It doesn't have to be. I'll tell you at the end how you can find freedom at every question, at every level. Christ is an answer for you. But He binds you up. And he ties you off. It says this in Proverbs. The evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. The cords of his sin hold him fast. Hebrews tells us that we need to let go of everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. <coughs> do you really honestly think the devil has to do a whole lot of effort to ensnare us? It so easily entangles us. I guarantee that you have a place of weakness in your life. I was listening to Dr. Stanley this morning, and he was talking about this very thing. I'm surprised he's preaching my sermon, but that's all right. Um, he's allowed to, I suppose. But, uh, but he was talking about this very thing, about how, how quickly and easily we are bound by these besetting sins that we think we can get no freedom from. So if you've allowed the thief to enter your home, if you've been tied up, the final question then is, have you lost your possessions? Have you lost your possessions? Then he can rob his house. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless first ties up the strong man? Then he can rob his house. Fathers, I'm telling you right now, you are meant to be the strong man of your house. To guard your house and protect your home. And I'm not talking about your property. I'm not talking about your TV and VCR. I'm not talking about your car in the driveway. I'm talking about your wife and your children and your grandchildren and the things that are most precious to God. Are you the strong man in your home to guard them? Because I promise you, if you allow yourself to be tied up, the devil will steal them right away from you. What woman can endure a husband who does not love the Lord? I don't know. I watched my mom do it for years. Do you know how many times my mom left my dad? No, of course you don't. You weren't there. I was. Because he didn't love the Lord. He didn't protect our home from unrighteousness. 
not until after he was saved, and that was just a few years before he died. Men, where are you to guard and protect your homes? To tell your wife, the devil will not come to you. He's got to get through me first. To tell your kids, kids, you are safe in the arms of your father. I am the strong man of my house. And God forgive me for being so weak. Because I will not let the devil carry off my possessions. He wants to. He wants to steal the heart of my children. He wants to turn the eyes of my wife to another man. She rejects him and refuses all the time. There was a day that she was working at this school a thousand years ago. And when we were first married. And... Um, she's working at the school, and this big, tall, handsome son of a gun was working there, too. And, and he's, he's about as big as Bob. Uh, the guy's huge. The guy's uh, just a giant. And, and, and he was flirting with my wife. I, I was young and stupid then, um, but I was just as brave as a snake. And, and I confronted the man. Patty tells me, oh, it's just a little flirtation. Well, she wasn't flirting back. I mean, my wife is the most honorable woman in the world. But he was flirting with her, and I was too much. I wasn't going to have that. So I walk into there, and here he is standing up there. And I tell him, um, before anything gets too far, I said, you better first get through me. And here's this young, strapping man. Here I am, this little guy. And there's nothing more powerful than a husband's protection. One of the things we see in the movie, early on in the movie we watched last night, was this father saving his son. And then the question was asked, would you have held on? Of course I would have. To the, to, to the very death of my life, I would have held on. If it meant that I had to be drugged through town for miles to save my child, I would have held on. Until there was no breath left in me to, to defend that which is precious. I will not let the man come in and steal from me my things, my precious things in my life. He comes in to steal. This is the trap. Once we've allowed the enemy into our lives, he will leave nothing behind of any value. Our faith will be fractured, our homes will be broken, our lives will be crushed, and the precious things will be delivered into the hands of our foe. When once we allow him in, and he binds us up. Back, back to the issue of uh, drug abuse. One of the things that I hear those who are suffering in this, in this way say that they can't control what they're doing and they're losing everything to it. They're losing everything to it. My dad was addicted to gambling. I don't know if you guys know that there's such a thing as it being addicted to gambling. Um, my dad was addicted to gambling. And before he was saved, he lost everything. He would leave work with a paycheck in his hand and never make it home with it. Because there was a casino on the way. And he had always in mind, he always justified it as my will. If I could just finally hit it big, if I could just finally strike it rich, if I could finally hit the right numbers, then everything will be fixed and I'll never have to do this again. It was a lie. And you know what? Before he died, he told me it was a lie. He apologized to me and to my mother. He allowed himself to be bound up. Don't allow yourself to be tied up, man. Because I promise you, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's all he comes for. Now, he may come in friendly garb and he may come as an angel of light. The Bible says he comes disguised as an angel of light and as workers, as ministers of righteousness, but it's a lie. Any time that any, anything you think that is contrary to Christian doctrine, contrary to Christ, anything that's against the Word of God is a lie. And you think, maybe this is the way it ought to be. No, 
Go back to God's word. Go back to what God promised. I want to take you all the way back to the Garden of Eden. There's a fellow by the name of Adam that was there. And a snake. And I hate snakes. If I can hit it with my lawnmower, I usually do. Amen. There you go. <laughs> I think, I think I hate snakes because that's what God cursed the snake. I'm going to crush its head. So I just take God's at his word and I just go crushing their heads. And But but there's a snake in the garden slithering up to talk to who? He doesn't go and talk to Adam. He goes and talks to Eve. Where is Adam? He was standing right next to his wife. The Bible says that she took a fruit and gave it to Adam who was with her. Why did he let the voice of the enemy enter into the, 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 the heart and the mind of his precious bride? Why didn't he say, hold on Eve, this is not God's way. This is not God's plan. Where was the, the man? He was bound up. Oh, sure, yeah, we'll just go ahead and do whatever you want. You know, we get tied up and we lose that which we have when we agree with the enemy over God. But I want to tell you that there's hope. And I'm not going to leave you with three questions that are disastrous like this. There is hope. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, says Jesus. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Jesus has come in every way to restore that which we have lost. The Bible says that Jesus will come and make our home within us. If you've allowed the enemy to enter in, let Jesus come and make his home with you. Let your life be his dwelling place. I promise you, if you give him every corner of your life, he will drive the enemy out from it. He will not participate with the enemy. He will not let the lies of Satan become the voice of your heart. See, so at the first stage, and ask him the question, have you let the thief come into your home? Invite Jesus in instead. Let him dwell in you. But you say, but pastor, I'm already at the second stage. I'm already at the second stage. I'm already bound up. I'm tied off. And I don't know how to get out. But Jesus, the Bible says, has come to set the captives free. Ask him to cut the cords that are binding him. Ask him to take his word and use it as a surgeon's knife to cut you free from the lies that have trapped you. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be fun. The sin of the flesh, the sin of this world is easy and, and feels good for a time. It seems good for a season. But to leave that behind is not going to be easy. But He will set you free. The Bible says if the Son has set you free, you're free indeed. If the Spirit of the freedom of Christ is in you, if, if, if Christ is in you, then the Spirit has set you free. You need to live in that freedom. Not freedom to do whatever you want. That's license. That's not freedom. Freedom to live and serve and walk with and worship the Lord. You say, but you don't understand, Pastor. I've already gotten to the third stage. Everything's gone. It's all gone. There's nothing left. It's all been taken from me. I don't have my wife anymore. I don't have my husband anymore. I don't have my kids. I don't have my home. I don't have anything. In Christ, the Bible says that He will restore what the locusts have devoured. You come back to Christ, you come and stand with Jesus, and you watch Him bring back into your life that restoration that He has promised. Well, it won't be exactly the same. But He will fill your life again. 
There's nothing that the devil has stolen from you that Christ cannot restore if you trust him by faith. If you take him at his word and do what he says, you're going to find that his promises will be fulfilled. Men, are you strong enough? Are you strong enough? The answer is no. You're not strong enough and neither am I. I, I can't withstand an enemy who's been at his business for thousands of years. I can't withstand the pressures of this world in my own strength, in my own flesh. I need Christ to be my strength. Imagine for a moment a submarine that is not pressurized going down deep underwater. What happens to that submarine, you may ask? It gets crushed like a tin can. And that's it. It's got to be pressurized from the inside so that it can withstand the crushing forces that are outside of it. You see, we have to be pressurized from the inside. We have to have Christ within us to give us the strength that we need to withstand the crushing force that's outside of our lives. If you don't have Christ, I'm telling you now, you are already lost in this battle. You are already defeated. You're already bound up if you don't have Christ. So I'm going to call upon you right now. If you have never received Jesus Christ as your Savior and you've invited him in, if you've never invited him in, come now and receive the mercy of God. Maybe you are a Christian, but you're, you've allowed the enemy in and he's had rain into your home and he's maybe not quite bound you up yet. But he's had a voice into your life. And you need to come and say, Christ, forgive me for ever listening to the lie. I will believe your word instead. And invite Jesus to take up dwelling in your home, in your heart. He promised he would. He says, the Father and I will come and we will make our dwelling with you. In the Gospel of John, it says, maybe you are bound up in sin. Anger and lust and greed and selfishness and pride and whatever else it might be. He said, I'm already tied up. Good. And ask Jesus to cut you free. And he will. You don't have to stay bound. Maybe you've lost it all. The fact is, you've not lost all it all yet. Because you're still here breathing. You have a chance. You have an opportunity right now to be restored in Christ question is, will you? It all comes down to a choice. Jesus is invited you.